When you want to go outside of layer two, or you want to move to a layer three entity, now we're talking about layer three network switches. <clears throat> and layer three network switches allow you to route or take traffic between isolated VLANs and allow them to intercommunicate. In order to, to get a grasp of kind of what the concept is and why we do this, as painful as it can be, I'm gonna do a very, very, very quick high level overview of what the IP address classes are. There are internally based reserved ranges that are used special purpose. And the reason why 10 172.16 and 192.168 are probably seen on almost every surveillance network that you touch is you will never find those numbers out on the internet. Those are reserved for internal class use only. They are not routable. They do not go out to the internet. So typically these numbers should be used. But in each class of those, class A, class B, and class C, there is a variance in the number of networks that you can support and the number of hosts that are supported per network. So identifying kind of how these things are set up and how they relate to each other is shown on the next slide. We said that a, a class A network is in the previous slide defined as 1000 is class A, 172.16 is class B, and 192.168 is class C. To understand what the breakdown is, each one of those class networks, class A, B, and C, has a default subnet mask associated with it. And the role of the subnet mask is nothing more than identifying what the ID or identification of the network is and what the unique host is on that network. So in a class A network environment, we can see that we have an, a default uh, subnet mask address of 255.0.0.0. Class B will use 255.255.0.0 and class C is 255.255.255.0. So to the right, I put an example here that shows a typical class A network highlighted in yellow, and the host ID highlighted in a blue color. Where the 255 stop across the octet range defines what network you belong to. So in this particular instance, this belongs to network 10. In 255, 255 or a class B, the network is 172.16. In a class C, the example of the network here is 192.168.100. Once you can identify what net network you belong to, any host within a VLAN that belongs to the same network will be allowed to intercommunicate. More often than not, that may not be shown in, in a notation that shows a full subnet mask. Each one of these values here, 255, is worth eight bits in binary. So in this particular instance, the total count of 255.0.0.0 is eight. 255, 255, 0, 0 is 16, and 255, 255, 255 is 24. So rather than writing out this subnet mask, you'll often see the CIDR notation, meaning that 255, 0, 0, 0 is a slash 8, 255, 255 is a slash 16, and 255, 255, 255 is a slash 24. So in the corresponding slide here, I've got some examples of <clears throat> hosts that reside in VLAN 200. And I often use this as an example to allow people to calculate out what hosts are allowed to communicate. If I have a slash 24 on, on uh, computer one, that means I have a 255, 255, 255 mask. That would mean the network ID is 192, 168, 100. For both of these, the network ID matches and they'd be allowed to communicate. Also on C13, the net mask would be 192, 168, 100. Those three computers, C1, C2, and C13 would be allowed to communicate. C14 would not because the network ID in this case is only 16 bits or 192, 168. So when you go through and you, you do some of these calculations out, both color coded here, you can see which hosts are allowed to communicate based upon their network ID which hosts are not allowed to communicate based upon their network ID. And understanding some of the basics of this helps you understand the next portion I'm going to talk about. It's not that you have to take everything away from this. It's that when I start talking about what a layer three network is versus layer two, if you don't understand some of the common basics of IP addressing, it makes the next part pretty difficult to understand. 
<clears throat> so here's an example that I'm looking at where I see two hosts, host one and host two. In this example, they're using a slash 24 or a 255, 255, 255 subnet mask. Highlighted in green, you can see that under VLAN 10, the host is 192.168.10. That's its network ID. And host two is 192.168.20. Meaning even if these were in the same VLAN, they belong to different networks and not be allowed to intercommunicate. So what a router does is it's a common machine that has interfaces that belongs to the network IDs of each of the subnets. So in this particular instance, we have a router here that has interfaces. It has one for 192.168.10. Because the dot one address is in the same network ID as VLAN 10, H1 and this interface would be allowed to communicate. In essence, it would become its default gateway out of the network. Under VLAN 20, you can see 192.168.20 and the subinterface of 192.168.20.1 belong to the same network or 20.1 would become its default gateway out. Whenever you look at a router, it simply is a software-based entity that has interfaces that belongs to each of the VLANs. And when communication wants to happen in this case between VLAN 10 and VLAN 20, it must pass it to its default gateway or its router. So, when 192.168.10.10 cannot find its local resource because it's trying to get to 20.10, when it fails, it will forward it to its default gateway of 10.1. The router will then bridge the table and pass the traffic back out to VLAN 20 and reach its recipient. Now, traditional routers, or where you see a Cisco software-based router or an integrated services router, I will tell you should never be used for high volume video routing. And the reason being is it's software based. It cannot handle the packets per second that you will actually use to process between these two particular entities for video traffic. The evolution of routing led to what we call layer three switching. And layer three switching does the exact same function as what we just looked at in that router, but it is not done from a software based entity. In essence, the Broadcom ASICs chips that reside on the actual switch itself allow you to create something called SVIs or switched VLAN interfaces. So I define VLAN 10 and I set its IP address of 192.168.10.1. And I define VLAN 20 and set its IP address to 192.168.20.1. And then I plug H1 and H2 into their corresponding VLANs. Rather than going to a software based router, the actual ASICs in the switch will bridge the communications and route at wire speed. This is why creating VLAN or segmentation around networks does not cause a lack of performance or an issue because everything on layer three switches is now done at line rate or line speed. So the big difference between layer three switching and traditional routing is their ability to do it at line rate. Now, this is an itch, and obviously this is an older base switch, but it really helps bring into to light some things that people may not be aware of. This is actually an ASIC from a Cisco 3850, and or it's an infrastructure or a structural diagram from one. And I'm not going to get into what port ASICs are or switch fabrics or even the FIs that exist on it, only to let you know that in this 48 port switch, the first 24 ports are serviced by three independent FIs and one port ASICs, while the other 24 ports are the latter 24 ports, ports 25 through 48, are serviced by a different ASICs and a different hardware entity. So where does this cause issues in traditional networks when people are implementing surveillance? What do people do when they traditionally plug in switches? They start with port one and work their way right to left. And they'll typically put all their high volume servers in ports one through 12. Well, in essence, what you've done when you do that is when you plug into one bank, you're processing the majority of your traffic through one ASICs, while the remainder of the ASICs in the switch are doing absolutely nothing. One of the things you can do to actually very quickly increase your performance is load balance your high performing or high bit rate entities, and you put them across all the FIs and all the ASICs, and you balance them across the switch. <clears throat> 
By doing that, you access each one of the ASICs and each one of the FIs and can achieve a higher level of performance. 